Introduce yourself. By the way, I, I'm Nick Wodaschek. I'm the uh, news director for WTSR. It's our oh. college radio station. Um, my first question was, you, you just had a second release of your album, Strange Desire, where each of your songs is covered by a different female artist. What like kind of inspired you to make that decision? Like, why why did you feel it was super important to? Um, I thought so. When I, a lot of times when I write songs, I kind of hear them more in like a female voice. Mm -hmm. I actually sing them way higher in my head, and then uh, kind of like lower the key from there. But I, I like any project that calls back to how the songs are made, mm -hmm. um, all the different steps in making an album. I think the more information on how you you make the records that the people who listen to the records have. Uh, the cooler and, and the more exciting it is. Um, so I wanted to do a project, I, I think with, like in a full circle way, like um, re-represent re the songs um, covered by the people who inspire them to be written in the first place, which to me is a really cool concept. Yeah. And then also I like the idea of like bookends of cycles, like music changes so much once it's out in the world because people change it the way they interpret it. So this felt like a perfect time, like almost like the last moment of this record cycle to fully re-release the album kind of the way almost I heard it in my head early on. Alright, that's awesome. Going off of that, um, I also had a question about Terrible Thrills. Um, I wanted to know, how did you choose who wanted you, who you wanted to collaborate with and then mm -hmm. which song they would sing? Uh, there was different methods. So, so the most important thing, so I, I made a pretty concise list and pretty much the list I made when I was just sort of dreaming about it on my phone is, is pretty much who it ended up being. Because everyone are people that I'm really inspired by either because I know them and I've worked with them or just because I really love their work. So it couldn't just be like some artist I thought was cool. It has to be someone who really means a lot to me and I think about when I write because that's what's very connected about it to me. Um, and so certain people I called early on, you know, then there was like an issue of just numbers. Like when there was 11 songs, I was like, what do you think you want to do? Yeah. And then the songs started getting taken. Um, but then other people, th there were things that I really wanted them to do like I Want to Get Better is a really weird one because it's a very personal song. It's kind of sung in this like sp spoken sort of sung way. It's, yeah. it's just sort of odd and I couldn't imagine anyone doing it. And I'm a huge Tanache fan and what she does is so almost the opposite of what I do yeah. that it really excited me to imagine her doing that one. So that was one that I suggested. But the whole project, even the recording process, it was done so all over the place in a cool way. Yeah. Uh, I'm EJ of the on-campus TV station Lions Television, and uh, I guess just to build off of the Terrible Thrills uh, questions, uh, do you have like a standout track you think who impressed you the most of all the ones that all the females who contributed to the album? Um, this artist named Mo um, did a song called "You're Still a Mystery," mm -hmm. and there was just something about hearing it in her voice that really, really blew me away. Um, but it's hard to pick kind of like a, a favorite because they all. You know, hearing hearing your song coming back at you is a very strange and cool experience. Absolutely. But um, yeah, that that Mo one was pretty crazy for me for some reason. Okay, thank you. All right, last question about about you know, str like the Strange Desire re-release. I noticed that "Take Me Away" was covered by both Brooke Candy and your sister Rachel. Yeah. How how what was that like? Like, cause there's like I, there's like a certain level of all right, another artist is covering my song, but like your sister covered your song. Um. I, I, I just wanted her to be involved in the process and because and, um, you know people inspire me for different reasons and she's a big inspiration in a lot of the music um, and there's something about putting her and Brooke together that seemed kind of wacky and great I don't know why but it just kind of occurred to me <laughs> and I ran with it great. okay and then uh, Shadow of the City was last month I heard it was amazing. I wanted to hear, um, how do you see the festival evolving in the coming years, and do you think this is going to help, like, kind of revive New Jersey's music scene? Um, I see it evolving very naturally, and I think what's exciting about working on the festival is, you know, sometimes when you have one thing and it's everything you do, you can sort of smother it and destroy it, and the fact that, you know, I don't need to use this festival to put food on the table, and I don't need to use this festival to define everything that I am. It almost gives me the freedom to really do a good job and not try to like, you know, blow it yeah. up or sell it to someone or, you know, so I want it to move in a very kind of organic way. And we're already talking about next year and starting to plan that out. And this fr this first year was such a great experience um, that we want to just look at everything that went well and, and look at the, this feeling that was created and just maintain that. Yeah. Um, what was the other part of that question? Oh, you, th you think it'll like help revive like having more shows in New Jersey, something like that? Um, I, well, I think that Jersey's, you know, b the big re reason why I wanted to do the festival in the first place was so many artists don't come to Jersey because they can't because they play in New York City and you're not yeah. allowed to come 
within 100 miles or whatever it is. So it's just a very like logistical issue. It's not like for any lack of love for New Jersey. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think you know, the more shows, whether it's my show or, or anyone's show that happened in Jersey, the better because it just it just m makes bands realize that there's more of a market here and they can come and there's a whole different group of people that maybe don't want to go into the city and deal with this and that and see a show. So I, I would like to see more of a a future where you know Jersey, Philly, New York City are all seen as totally different markets because they really are. Yeah. You know, so many people, you know, don't get to see the shows because it's it's a little too far and it might not seem like a big deal to some people to drive 45 minutes, but it's just different. Um, uh, going off of Shadow of the City, uh, what are you most excited about? Like its growth. Like, do you want to see like more? Um, like, would you like to see like become like a multi-day festival even, or even like branch out like other like make it like a across like North Central South Jersey kind of event, or like well, like, would you have any like lofty expectations? Or? Yeah, I have a lot of like crazy ideas in my head. So I think that working on something and then translating it so it's great for the people who are buying tickets is all about like having those crazy ideas and then picking one or two and yeah. just kind of slowly moving and, and, and building it. But um, ne next year I, I want it. I want to. I want to keep it one day, and I want to just make it even more awesome and have more kind of bizarre extra things mm -hmm. outside of the music and, and just kind of stamp it as like this really exciting thing that wasn't just a one-year idea but something that people can rely on as being this like great end of summer thing. Uh, um, and then from there, I think, uh, I think that there's, there's tons of space to kind of like keep dreaming about different stuff and whether it's extending it or mm -hmm. pushing it out to the beach or whatever it is, it, I, um, you know, whatever feels really exciting at the time. Awesome. All right, uh, last question. Does performing in New Jersey give you a little more like nostalgia as compared to like performing somewhere in like the Midwest? It gives me, performing in New Jersey, well there's, there's different perks to performing anywhere, so it's like mm -hmm. what's so amazing about performing in the place you're from is also what's so amazing in performing in a random place because you're in this place that you've never been or you don't really know what's what and you can kind of reinvent yourself however you like because you don't really know anyone there. But when you're in the place where you do know people and you know the streets and the road you drove there on, you know very well. It um, it's uh, you can't really can't really be anything but kind of a very specific version of yourself, mm -hmm. and that's really exciting too, especially for this band and these songs, which are really a lot of them are written in New Jersey. Jersey's referenced like crazy. It just it it feels special to really talk about that, and then also with everything with Shadow of the City that we talked about, it's it's not an experience I have a lot. Like, we don't get to play in Jersey a lot. This is the second or third time this band has ever played in Jersey. So it's not like, you know, California now. We've played tons and tons of shows in California, and you sort of understand what that vibe is. It's still kind of new, even though it's a hometown show. All right. That's cool. Um, before starting Bleachers, you were in Fun and Steel Train, and I wanted to know um, how all those years of making music and touring have helped shape your current musical style. Um... Sometimes I don't know how, like, I, I can't articulate it, yeah. but I, I, I know that it's all extremely connected. Like, I don't see things in very separate ways, even though I do a lot of separate things. Like, every record I do, leading, you know, I'm working on a new Bleachers album right now, and that feels like a culmination of 20 years of making music. It yeah. doesn't feel like, you know, the past six months or, or whatever. It, everything always feels like the thing I'm doing before I die or something, you know, like the, the most important thing I'm doing. Um, but but beyond that, it's hard for me to fully like intellectualize how the other projects I've done actually speak to things. Yeah. I think that's something I'll think about when I'm like, you know, like hopefully a hundred and dying or, or whatever, and then I'll 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 be clear what was what. But I feel very like locked up in this phase right now of just um, getting a lot of work done and not necessarily needing to understand it, but more needing to put it out. Yeah. Um, this is the last question I will have for you. Thanks for coming out again. Um, so I asked a similar question to Modern Baseball earlier. Uh, so October is Mental Health Awareness Month on camp uh, worldwide, and on campus we we really uh, uh, try our best to lower the stigma and things like that, and like bring awareness so, like more people would be aware. And this might hit home, but like, how do you think you can come? Like, how do you think you're combating the stigma through music and through different forms of like I guess reaching out to fans and listeners, things like that, like, how do you think? Uh, well, I think the best way and the only way that I've ever known how is just to be very honest about things that you go through, um, because things are only shameful because we don't talk about them, and that's just something that gets decided or not decided, um, and you see it change with a lot of things, but, you know, I remember growing up, it was very shameful to, like, talk about taking medication, there was a stigma on that, that's changing, 
you know, still some people have opinions, but that's changing just through people talking about it. It's like, it's almost like, um, you know, because everybody struggles in all these different ways. Um, it's kind of like, like, even what's happened with, like, the LGBT community. It's like, you know, when I was growing up in the 90s, I feel like the vibe was like, oh, it's some, like, freak thing that's like one in 6,000 and they all live in the West Village of New York and then, you know, you realize it's everyone, you know, and the same thing with mental health, everyone's just sort of hiding with it, you know, it's everyone. So the more it becomes super mainstream and you just talk about those things, the more it's like people just kind of stop giving a shit, which is really the most exciting uh, moment in any movement when it's just not even interesting anymore. No one gives a <laughs> um, And I think that uh, with mental health stuff, a lot of things have moved towards that place, you know. I don't know if we live in the kind of culture anymore that would, you know, publicly shame Amanda Bynes for going through what she went through when, when that was all happening. Or I just saw the Amy Winehouse documentary and, and they, there was a whole piece on it, which now I remember of like, you know, all the late night shows and all the press, like just making fun of her, you know, for having issues that she was dealing with. Um, so I think that that's changing more and more as we back those people who would do that into a corner. But yeah, my, my only, the only thing that I've ever been able to do and the, and the best thing I think anyone could do is to just talk about it because, you know, if you're in a room, metaphor for the world, with mm -hmm. 10 people and nine out of the 10 people are all talking about how they're on antidepressants and they struggle with this and that, you know, the last person in the room who might think it's all kind of wacky doesn't have much of an opinion anymore. Hi. Cool, nice to meet mm -hmm. you guys. Thanks nice for bringing me here. Thanks for coming. Yeah, yeah. of course.